If I will be shouting, despite the fact that we have a microphone, is that because I'm used to addressing such a gatherings under a tree and not in such a beautiful uh, room like this one. So you'll excuse me for that. Uh, first, I'd like to pass you greetings from the African women peace workers. And the ones I interacted with last were the African uh, women from, from Kenya. And as I was landing nearer to Santa Barbara, all I could remember about this place is about uh, the films that I've watched in Kenya. <laughs> I think maybe they, that featured this place. And I think today I'm privileged to share with you the work of African women. And as a relief and rehabilitation coordinator, as a coordinator for peace and development network, I think today I'm sharing with you as an African woman, more so. And maybe I should start by sharing with you who is an African woman. An African woman is a breadwinner in her family. An African woman is a, a conflict resolver in her own family. An African woman is a home builder in her family. And so when I was growing up as a child with my other eight brothers and sisters, whenever we had a conflict, we went to our mother. We rarely went to our father because that was trivial. But still in Africa today, we only go to men when things are out of the family that reach out to other ethnic groups. But because the men, maybe they have not been practicing so much, they are overwhelmed and they even don't know how to handle it. And maybe this is why now African women are taking up the responsibility even when it means conflicts are outside the family level. And now as a mother, I'm a mother of four, whenever my kids have problems, they come to me. The father is busy, and uh, that is, those are things for the women to, to sort out. And as a married woman, I was joking with uh, Cindy that whenever I have problems with my husband, I look forward to going to my rural home to report him to my mother-in-law. Yeah? And when things get so bad, it's when I can report him to my own mother. At that point, he will be kneeling and begging me, please don't report me to your mother. <laughs> yeah? This is the role of an African woman. And so first, when I went to work for the refugees from Somalia, after Somalia had just disintegrated in 1991, in the vehicles I was traveling with Somali women, they arrived, I don't know for how long they walked, to reach Kenya or what means they used, but they reach in their camp. There was an enclosure of an area that uh, enclosed about 30,000 refugees from Somalia. They arrived there, they leave their families, and the first place is where is the market? Because they have to put food in front of their children and their husbands. And I was overwhelmed. These women are so tired. They are in a new country. I'm sure they did not even know how to communicate. But priority was for them to get food for their children. And so they had to look where the market center is. They had to communicate maybe using signs to get that food. That is an African woman. Then after that, my own country had problems in 1991. We changed our form of governance from one party system which we thought was democratic, I mean which we, we thought was dictatorial, to multi-party form of governance. And because the people who benefited, the politicians who benefited so much from the one party system did not like the idea of changes, they incited their communities 
and what the result we had was that clashes which claimed about 1,500 people and we had 300,000 displaced. And again, when we had this problem, I remember the first relief supporters were from the women. I remember the religious leaders sending out the pastoral letters to get food and they asked the women all over to assemble in churches so that they can receive their fellow women and their families and men and support, give them the first meal before they get on their feet. And I saw the same. Women came and the priority was how do I get food to my children? And so as an African woman, a social worker, I was assigned to work again for my own community for 40,000 internally displaced victims. And at, the point, at that point, I had not received any training. In fact, I think I came to receive training in conflict transformation about five years later. But my instinct as an African woman, after I got so tired of crying with the women, there was no enough food to eat, there was no enough medication, we had buried so many children, I realized, no, something had to be done. These women just need to get back where they came from, a fertile area. Their, their neighbors also are having a problem. As much as they produced so much food, they could not travel to the market centers to sell. And by the way, that is where you get the indicators. If you are looking for the indicators, if the time is now ripe for us to start peace initiatives, I received a lot of complaint from the women from the market centers. They were not getting enough food because their neighbors feared because of the clashes there was a lot of mistrust. They could not travel to sell the food. And so together at the market centers we said, hey, what can we do? Are we going to watch all our children die? Yet there is food across. We decided we had to do something. And so at that point we realized we had to reach out. And as an African woman, again, though the clashes were called ethnic clashes, I did not belong to any ethnic or any clan. And so I'm a Kenyan African woman, and I did not fear to reach out to my perpetrators. I belong to a community that was in conflict. And so using my African womanhood, I traveled over to the enemy territory to reach out to the youths who were still in the forest staging the wars. And we asked them to come to the negotiating table. But I was culturally sensitive because I know, yes, again, as an African woman, I know some youths could not respect me. My position is in the kitchen. But I realized that position at times it can be a strong point. So I fronted one man and I told him, hey, can you discuss with the youths in this workshop? We had a three days uh, workshop trying to analyze what are the problems and how can we get together, getting the views from our perpetrators. So I told them, well, you know, my place is in the kitchen. I will be in the kitchen ensuring that you get your food. Uh, I will be providing you anything you want. And I don't remember how many jugs of water I brought the youths, but each time I put the water there, I said one word. Each time I put the water there, I said another word. At the third day, they said, ha, huh, this woman has something to share with us. Let us allow her to sit and discuss with us. And that was a very important timing for me because then we were moving into the planning stage. And together, I sat with the youths we planned on how to get now into a meeting with their, the so-called the, uh, the, the victims who are still living in the camp. And for three days, no community had crossed over. But after these meetings, the meeting, the youths assured me that now, yes, we are ready for negotiation. And we reached out to the perpetrators in the camps to bring them to the negotiating table. It was out of the various meetings, analyzing our relationships, analyzing our perceptions, that we agreed now, yeah, 
we can come together and peacefully coexist. And after that, the youths collaborated to even build houses for the people they called the enemies. But we realized, no, if we end here, it's, it's sort of, uh, it would sort out the problem because we had issues to deal with. And so we formed again women. We have this uh, issue of women groups in, in Africa. If you reached in Africa now in any country, I can mobilize for you all women because in each village they have the women groups. And so we discussed with the women groups, how can we continue building the relationship? As we walk towards uh, the well to fetch the water, as we go to the church together, and women took charge of continuing to build relationships among the communities that were involved in clashes. At that point, I left the women to continue. Then I was appointed as a coordinator for Peace and Development Network, which is a national umbrella that brings together about 200 non-governmental organizations, religious institutions, and community-based organizations. And the purpose of this network, it was formed so that we can coordinate our services. And on the network, we have NGOs that are dealing with human rights issues, others are dealing with development, and others are dealing with relief. And we realized the clashes took us to zero level. The development stopped for almost a year. There was no food. And we realized that we have to get together and see how we can collaborate. And in this meeting, in, in, on this network, what we do now is that we go to an area, what is a need? Is there still need for relief? Okay, which NGOs are the best to give this? Is it development? Which NGOs can move in to, death, to do that? And so we meet at least twice a year. The first year to analyze what we've done. The second, uh, to, 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 to prioritize what we have to do. And then the, towards the end of the year, again, we meet to see what have we done and what is there that needs to be done. And through this network, again, when I was at the community level, I realized the skills. Women naturally came out to help in reconciliation. But we realized if we gave them more skills, they can do better work. And through this network, now we've trained around 500 community-based organizations that they are working at their communities because they are at the community level. They know how, when the situation is getting worse, they know how to tell that no, the neighbors are not behaving well to each other, that the women are not working together to their well, what could be the problem? And they have the basic skills again to mediate and see that the situation does not go out of control. Again, there is lobbying. Our conflict is political as any other nation that is going through transition, most of the wars that we are fighting is not our war. There is a lot of manipulation from the government, from the politicians through the communities. And so what we are doing is whenever we see that there is a politician who is ready to manipulate the people, we go there and we lobby. We get the facts right, then we come and we organize a meeting involving even the international organizations to see how we can deal with this. So that was at the national level. But then uh, we realized that in Africa, when we thought, when I was at the community level, I thought I was the only woman at that community level that was confused and didn't know what to do. When I came to a national meeting, I realized, hey, there are other women from the other regions. They were also who were struggling. And when I went back to my community, I was sort of energized to know that there are others there. But how about Africa? Some of us come to trainings here in US or in Europe, but when we get back, we get so isolated. And so we realize that one way we can support each other is to form again a, a network. And we have a network called Coalition for Peace in Africa. Again, it was championed mostly by women. And I get so overwhelmed whenever I come to attend international meetings to see the role that African women play. For example, when we came here, was it in 1998 to attend the UN Commission for the Status of Women? I remember the women from Burundi. We sat together 
They are French speaking, they could not communicate. But together with other women from the other African nations, we sat together to see how can we come up with a report and protest the sanctions. The sanctions that the leaders were not being affected, but the women that were affected. And the beauty out of that meeting, I realized when we got back after one year, the sanction was lifted. And this is the work that African women are doing. I'm so happy that people like uh, Jan, Jenna, and Cindy are promoting our voices. Because even in Kenya, you don't get to hear this voice at all. You are at the community level and all you do is you are concerned about what you are doing. Our voices are not lifted. The fact that I stand here, courtesy of everyday Gandhis, to share with you, I really thank God. And what, when I get back, this is what I'm going to share with the people. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Jan Jenner. I'm the director of the Institute for Justice and Peace Building, which is one of the arms of the Conflict Transformation Program at Eastern Mennonite University. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes putting a bit of what um, Tekla has said into a bit of a wider theoretical and um, analytical framework. Um, first of all, just, just two or three words about the Conflict Transformation Program. Um, is a graduate program of Eastern Mennonite University, which is a small denominational college university, as, as Cindy said, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. A very new program. We began in 1995 with our first two students. Have now currently have 95 students in the program from a number of countries. Um, and deliberately teach conflict transformation as opposed to conflict resolution, very political um, as well as academic and theoretical statement that says that not all conflicts can be resolved or should be resolved. Um, an example we like to use a lot is that the actually the conflict between Rosa Parks and the Montgomery School Board was almost mediated. There were five points that Martin Luther King was um, involved in mediating and four of those were agreed to. The fifth one was not and, and what ended up coming out of that was of course this was one of the sparks for the civil rights movement and we would say very clearly that that would have been a tragedy had that conflict been resolved at that level because it needed to be exposed and transformed and a larger society trans societal transformation happen um, so anyway that's enough about our program for now I can answer questions about that later if, if anyone wants I um, actually, Ken, Tekla and I knew each other in Kenya. I worked, worked and lived there from 1989 to 1996 and worked um, in different ways on the conflicts that she was describing a few minutes ago. And my own transformation in terms of how to work on conflicts came as a result of my experiences in Kenya um, I can remember the day exactly when I first saw a village that was absolutely and completely destroyed. Not one building left, not one business left, not one home left. The school destroyed, the churches destroyed. Um, and I realized how much um, violence could destroy lives and and communities, political systems, everything very quickly and how much work it took to overcome that. Since my return to the U.S. and working at the Conflict Transformation Program, it's been a real privilege to work with dozens and dozens of people like um, Tekla who come through our program either for the master's degree or for shorter term trainings and realizing that the kind of work that she, um, she talked about a few minutes ago is happening all over the world and in many ways and many um, exciting things happening from that. What, what I often find in academia and in policy levels is that stories like Tekla just related are seen as um, anecdotal, as perhaps inspiring, as coming from people with good hearts, Mother Teresa kind of things, but not strategic, not very analytical, and probably pretty naive and not having a lot to say about societal transformation, political governments, and change at national and international levels. Um, 
And that's one of the one of the things that certainly our program and another number of other groups that are working on a conflict transformation analytical framework are saying no. This is a very important part of international relations that and international peace and governance that is often neglected and unknown. One of the um, soon after within a year or two after I was back in the US Actually, Cindy was with me. We had an, an opportunity to visit the wife of the former ambassador to Kenya, who had been in Kenya during all this time, and we were relating um, some, of the, some of the work that I had done in Kenya at that point. And the ambassador's wife said, well, that couldn't have happened because we didn't know anything about that. That wasn't happening during that time. And for me, that just illustrates the huge gap between what happens at community civil society levels and what happens at diplomatic, first track diplomacy, international political levels. Um, it's just, it's not even ignored, it's just unknown. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about, the, about being able to collaborate with the Everyday Gandhi's project in terms of being able to get some of these stories known. Everyday Gandhi's are working much more in terms of overall popular press and s civil society here and around the world getting to know that. I tend to work much more in the academic and policy level and trying to trying to take Tekla's story out of the anecdotal and into the theoretical and um, analytical framework mode so that um, it enters the conversation at the policy level. Um, but I think we're both working on very much the same, the same mode. Um, I, I would love to stand here and tell you the stories of dozens of other Gandhis that I've come in contact with, both women and men in Africa and around the world that are doing very much the same thing and are affecting um, policy um, and peace and stability and, and security in countries around the world. But I'll relate just two very quick ones. I was doing a training in West Africa just about a week and a half ago. I was in Ghana for about nine days and then went on to Nigeria for a few more days. But this training in, ni in Ghana brought together um, experienced peace builders from 11 different countries in West Africa and we were doing a number of different different exercises with them and some advanced training and two stories I heard there I'd like to share with you one comes from Sierra Leone Sierra Leone as you may well know has been in a atrocious civil war for about the last 10 years in which hundreds of thousands of people have been killed and displaced and amputated and one of the techniques that has been used by a couple of the rebel groups in that country is to amputate arms and legs of just about anybody. It's been very hard to figure out kind of who they are targeting, but down to babies. So babies, children, women, men, combatants and non-combatants. There's thousands and thousands of, of what, they're, what they call over there the amputated um, in Sierra Leone now. Um, I was with a group of people from about three different organizations that had been working at very similar, doing very similar things to what Tecla described within Sierra Leone for the past, most of the 10 years. Um, the week before I was there, a ceasefire had been signed. There was a symbolic bur burning of guns to symbol symbolize, I think it was about a six month disarmament process that had happened. And the people from Sierra Leone were just really excited because it looked like this, um, this ceasefire may hold and this peace agreement. And what they were also particularly excited about is a proclamation that came from the Parliament of Sierra Leone that attributed much of the work to bring the rebel groups into negotiation with the government to the work of these peace building groups that had been working on a community level and had been able to move up and effect, effectively become an important part of the negotiating process in Sierra Leone. The other story is, is fairly similar from Niger, where I, um, one of the members, one of the participants in this workshop was, I think, the director of the uh, Human Rights Commission in Niger, who had been the person who had done the negotiating with the rebel groups in, in northern Niger, um, and had persuaded them to trust, the, trust well, 
there was an official negotiation process at the government level. He had worked behind the scenes to gain the trust of the, of the rebels to get them to attend the negotiating seminar and had worked with the government to agree to a partial amnesty for some of the, some of the rebels. And so he had pushed the negotiating to the national level where it could take place. Again, quite unknown, um, probably when the history of the um, negotiations of the Niger Civil War is written, the, the Niger Human Rights Commission will not be, um, not be mentioned. And yet, from my view, point of view as I saw it, was absolutely necessary in getting that ceasefire, ceasefire to happen. And I could go on and on with stories like that, um, but I think that's enough for now, and I will close and invite Tekla and Cindy to come up and join for a question and answer. You could definitely make it so. Uh, this actually just happened in conversations. I should introduce and probably should have at the beginning mentioned uh, Charlene Houston, who is sitting Hello. back there, who uh, is part of the Gandhi team in Santa Barbara. We work closely together, and uh, she has uh, initiated and continued conversations um, with several uh, people involved in media, potential funders, etc. And so um, just this afternoon, about an hour before we came, she said, guess what? Uh, there's room on the radio show tomorrow morning. So I don't even know the details. I just know that I have to go over there and show up. And maybe Charlene can answer that more specifically. that they would be very interested also in uh, carrying these conversations. Great. We'll let's get it on the top. Okay. Women's uh, wings. Wings. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come, we can talk later. Okay. I think back there first and then um, may I address um, uh, three three short questions to Ms. Wanjala? Uh, uh, on the on the more grassroots level, um, um, when you when you uh, you were talking about your negotiations, your lobbying with with manipulative politicians, um, and when you go into lobby, uh, who you consider to be a manipulative politician, uh, do you do you confront them, or or do you talk nicely to them? Or how do you go about negotiating with them the most effectively? By confrontation, by being nice to them, or, or how do you go about lobbying them the most effectively? The second question is, um, uh, the, the AIDS epidemic seems to be depleting so much energy from, from Africa that you know, it's just catastrophic. Uh, what, what, can, what can be done to keep it from just depleting all the energy of Africa? And then thirdly, um, Thirdly, uh, it, it, you know, it's just my impression that the United States doesn't have a very constructive relationship with Africa at all in the, in the present day. And, and what can people in the United States do that is constructive and, and uh, positive in, in, in building a positive and constructive relationship with, with African people? Okay. I think I'll share the questions with Jan. And uh, I'll, I'll like to address the first one. Um, once we go for our fact-finding mission as to what is causing the tension and we realize that a politician is involved, then we call upon that politician and we share with him what we've uh, so far uh, gotten from the community and ask him and share with him the consequences if he continues that way. If he doesn't see 
or he doesn't do as we've shared to step back, then we are forced to go public and going public is sharing what with our media to share with them what really the issues are and how the politician is involved. If that does not work, then we come back to Nairobi, the headquarter, and we call other stakeholders the, from the NGOs and the international communities. Like when Jan was there, I knew that if I brought Jan on board, then I'll have brought other uh, international organizations from, from US. And that is one thing that Kenyans fear. They, are, they fear that uh, public relation outside. So that, that is the method we use. It's, it's, it's very hectic. As um, about AIDS, all we can do, as per now, we cannot even afford the medicine that even can keep them in terms of pain or prolong their life. Kenya cannot afford that. And all we have been doing is a lot of awareness creation yeah, among the communities and how, on how AIDS is transmitted. And another thing is uh, culturally, our culture also uh, works against us when it comes to, to AIDS and we are educating the people on the effect of uh, circumcision, using the same knife for all the people, wife inheritance and all that. And as the relationship of US, I would like Jan first to respond first. <laughs> I'm not sure I really am ha happy taking this question. Um, you know, I think as many people in this room know, during the Cold War era, um, Africa was one of the one of the battlefields in which um, the Soviet Union and the U.S. fought its battles um, with devastating effects to a lot of countries. Since the end of the Cold War, it's. Um, I don't, I don't feel like it's ever stabilized in terms of what U.S. policy toward um, Africa is. It tends to be, in my opinion, my not unbiased opinion, um, short term, not well thought out, and um, often pretty chaotic. Um, for example, one of the things that's happening with Kenya right now is it looks like, though it's pretty unclear, ongoing negotiations for use um, in northeastern Kenya of military bases by U.S. and British forces um, in terms of possible attacks on Somalia um, where there's said to be Al-Qaeda um, cells. Whether that, you know, whether there are Al-Qaeda cells in Somalia, I certainly don't know that. But I think the use of, um, the use of the of military military use of northeastern Kenya is quite ill-advised in terms of Kenya right now. Kenya is going through, um, will have a presidential election by the end of the year in which there has to be this time a transition of leadership unless the constitution is changed or overridden. It's a very shaky time for Kenya right now and the presence of troops will not um, help that situation. So. I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but um, what America... Well, how about the positive side of it, particularly the grassroots? You know, the people in the United States, what can the people in the United States on the grassroots level do, do to create a more constructive and positive relationship with Africa, with, with the grassroots level of people in Africa? Yeah, I, I think... Um, any way that increases the knowledge about the about the people, um, both ways, realistic knowledge. Um, Tekla men mentioned um, television shows and, sh and such. At least a year ago, when I was last in Kenya, the most popular TV show in Kenya is Santa Barbara. Um, it's shown every night. It's about I think I think it looks like about five to eight year old episodes of Santa Barbara, which is shown every night during prime time. That is not the picture of the U.S. that, you know, I really want Kenyans to have of us. And I think the picture we as Americans tend to have of Africa is everyone is either warlords or they're starving. And there's no large, you know, large group of people that are going about their lives and raising children and, um, you know, living good lives. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the thing I think everyday Gandhis could do is, is show this, this group of people like, like Tekla who are neither starving or cutting off people's arms. How, how that happens and how we get, get people at the grassroots in the U.S. to come to know that, I wish I had an answer to that. 
see. Yes, I think. Just before okay. we move on, I want to add um, a quick thought on that. One of the things, one of the tenets that has emerged as a theme in the peace building community is uh, you get what you prepare for. And uh, if you look at the military budget, particularly of the United States, but um, other countries that are participating in uh, heavy military activity, um, it's really not a surprise when a conflict arises or gets out of hand, and certainly one that has all kinds of subterranean interests that are at cross purposes and that involve money and natural resources and alliances and all that kind of thing. Um, it's not a surprise that what you then get is a, uh, a military response to conflict. So uh, we're fond of, of uh, dreaming that uh, at least perhaps there could be an equal budget, like maybe the, that extra $48 billion that's being tacked onto the defense budget. Maybe there could be another $48 billion or maybe <laughs> 47 billion that could be uh, put towards creative, nonviolent peace building, which could include uh, all kinds of activities. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> was discussed during the bombing of um, the former Yugoslavia um, was that there was a, a fairly significant period of time during which a lot of the military uh, captains and generals in Milosevic's army were close to defecting. And, you know, perhaps if someone had stepped in and offered them a, a university education at a fine European institution, they might have been encouraged to put down their guns and go do something constructive with their lives that would have then improved, uh, improved things for everybody. So it sounds a little outlandish and almost comical in the context of what's going on, but I think it's not unrealistic. And one of the things that Americans and Europeans in particular could do is to raise our voices and not only tell stories of the Teklas of the world, but insist that resources be put toward constructive peace building. Children in schools learning mediation, conflict resolution, and there's a whole slew of things. So that might be one, one conversation to continue. And most of the arms we, we fight each other with, are not manufactured, mostly in Africa. And maybe that is one way that we can join hands to lobby around issues of arm trade, issues of uh, structural adjustment policy that uh, increases the poverty level, which is manipulated by the politicians. And yeah, we have a lot to collaborate. Mm -hmm. you, I think you're next. I would like to make two comments and a question, if I might. One, having just gotten back from East Africa, uh, we noticed with great satisfaction that uh, the AIDS program was being addressed publicly. There were big billboards along in different towns and villages, which, you know, you, I don't think we're that progressive yet to get those billboards up in this country, but we were very impressed with that. Another thought was that with the tourists that are, the, the tourist industry is going to be a big economic block for, for uh, Kenya in particular, I believe, with those wonderful game reserves. And the tourists, U.S. tourists, and European tourists, as a matter of fact, going through there, seems to me could help your movement quite a bit by a little bit of educational material that you get the tour people to handle for the tourists. Now, our tour guide was excellent because he had a lot of the insight that you obviously have in this problem area, and uh, it seems to me that there is an opportunity there to expand your efforts in that direction. But one final question, uh, the, I forgot what it was, I was so busy talking. Oh, yes, in the political campaign now in Kenya, uh, how does your uh, program stand to gain or lose with the results of this upcoming election in uh, next year now? Do you, do you see any progress that is going to help you or is it going to hinder you? Um, one issue that um, the Kenyan civil society, especially most of the members of my network, that picked up to struggle with after our clashes, we realized that um, we were not just dealing with issues of land, issues above, but they were deep-rooted issues of the constitutional review. 
and we are now in the process of uh, that constitutional review, we are hoping that uh, one outcome of the constitution that we come with is reducing the powers, especially of the presidency, and separating the roles of the legislator, the, the executive, which one is the other, Jan? The judicial, <laughs> yes. Because we realized our conflict, again, the clashes, the root cause is bad governance. And, and we are hoping that um, we move out of that, that we have fair and free election, and that we put in place uh, leaders with vision who can guide Kenya into a prosperous uh, future. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered that. Yeah. Yeah. I think here and then I just had a question of, um, uh, regarding Zimbabwe and what, if anything, or, or if anything is being done um, involving women to resolve the, I mean, the conflict that's going on now, um, especially inside of the, the election coming up in March, and perhaps if, if you might be involved in anything there. Yeah, we, through the... I think that we, we, just like the Kenyans are struggling with their own issues in Zimbabwe, we have a group of peace workers, human rights activists, activists who are uh, working on their issues and I'm sure they are concerned about uh, what is happening. As I'm talking now, we have a, a training in South Africa uh, organized by this African Network Coalition for Peace in, in Conflict and um, we have a number of people from Zimbabwe who are attending and I'm sure such a meetings we don't just go to train but together we sit together to analyze the issues and how we can approach it. So there, is, there are efforts doing, going on there but again as I said dictatorship is the major issue in Africa. We can only do so much with the communities maybe changing the attitudes, the perceptions but again when we reach at that high level when we are confronted with a president who cannot listen to us, that is where we hope that international communities can come up and join with us to lobby around such issues. Yeah. Jan, I don't know if you want to. I think here and then back here and then over to the way. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on an earlier question. This deals with how you deal with difficult politicians. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably a code word for corrupt politicians. Mm -hmm. And corruption is one of the most debilitating problems in Kenya and other places in Africa. Mm -hmm. So the problem, of course, is your modus operandi is to go to these politicians and make transparent what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is the government also controls the media. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to talk more about how you deal with the problem of corruption mm -hmm. because it shortchanges so many aid operations mm -hmm. and also keeps many infrastructural projects from being built. So can you talk about corruption and how your organization deals with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, corruption is a big one <laughs> in, in, in Africa. And th that is when our human rights organizations come in. And we are not working alone. Like in Kenya, we work with some of the members from the opposition to watch on issues of corruption. And I don't know if you are familiar that we came up with a list of shame. And the list of shame where we exposed the politicians and how they have been involved in corruption right from the vice president down to the uh, a small man and I think that is what we can only do and yes the media is controlled but we have also alternative media like the alternative papers that we write which most community members uh, do and I think there is also collaboration for the media outside Kenya so if uh, for example KBC cannot uh, which is a Kenyan uh, network the TV network cannot pick up. We see how we can sneak to BBC or CNN to expose such. Again, it's a big struggle and a long one. Yeah, can, yeah, can I add a bit on that? Um, that I think also becomes an international problem. I just had mentioned bef just before about the um, military bases um, in northeastern Kenya. About there's a long history of, of both World Bank and IMF and bilateral aid being held back from Kenya because of corruption. 
And I think the latest round of holding back and saying, no, you can't have any more until the corruption is cleared out was six or nine months ago. I'm not sure exactly when. A anti-corruption bill was presented in the Kenyan parliament by the president, which said that basically, well, basically, it's, it's very clearly said that there would be amnesty for anyone that had committed economic crimes up till the day that the bill was passed. And for the first time ever, civil society in Kenya was so outraged by this that, it, that there was so much protest that for the first time ever, a bill that the president had presented didn't pass. And so Kenyans were saying we'd rather have the sanctions continue, as hard as that is, than have this bill which gives um, amnesty to the people who have committed that. Part of the negotiations, as, as I've been able to pull out of the Kenyan papers and some others um, for these bases, are basically give us the bases, we'll give you the money, um, which is Britain and the U.S. overriding the, the will of this fledgling democracy that is we're saying we're trying to promote civil society, promote that, and yet we're saying when it suits our purposes at the, as the U.S., we'll forget about the corruption and those issues. So it's, it's an issue that Tekla has to deal with. It's also an issue we have to deal with here, I think. Okay, back here and then up here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question may be addressed to all three of you, I'm not sure, but um, I'm, sp I'm sp specifically interested in your thoughts on the growing, the overwhelming problem of refugee problems. Refugees. Um, I don't know if any of if anyone I haven't found a source of information that has any clear kind of idea about the numbers of people that are currently in, in refugee status in, in terminal crisis. Um, I'm interested in the this spe specific socio psychological needs of refugee populations and what sorts of skills are required by practitioners, people working with them, for one thing. Um, in other words, the unique characteristics posed by these problems. And then I'm also interested in trying to get more news and information about um, unsituated, invisible people um, and, and providing news about that through the media, the media that we have. Um, at our disposal. So I'm also asking if you know of any sites, sources, locations, uh, places for news and information specifically about refugees and or, or people doing academic work as well in this area. So I'm interested in this at a couple of levels, but your thoughts on that? About the refugees, yes. Africa, we, we produce the biggest number of, of refugees. I may not have the figures, but you're talking of in terms of millions. But uh, yeah, there, there are some hopes. Like three quarters of the refugees from Kenya now, from Somalia, the, re, the refugees I talked about, they have returned back. And they have returned back because this sort of work. There were women who refused, uh, Jan, maybe you need to share about that also. There were women who refused to to fly Somalia in the midst of war, and they turned their homes into negotiating uh, venues where they could only allow people from opposed uh, the enemies to come in, but they leave their arms outside to come and negotiate, negotiate for, for peace. So in some places, we have some who are returning, like in Somalia, when we thought that Rwandese are returning, DRC Congo went into flames more, and it, it's a complicated issue. But it's everyday peace work that we do in the nations that enables them to go back. Yeah. You talk about the psychosocial sociological issues. Um, I've only worked fairly peripherally with with refugees, so I can only speak kind of on that level. But the, but the issue that I saw as one of the most devastating, both for refugees and internally displaced people, um, was the loss of identity. That you, that you no longer are a radio producer, you're a refugee. You're no longer a nurse or a teacher or whatever it is. You're simply a refugee. You're a hungry mouth that needs to be fed. You're a problem to be solved. And that stripping of identity, um, I think for any person or any group of people, um, 
not only is devastating personally, but leads then to cycles of repeating violence and, and um, destruction um, ongoing. Um, in terms of getting, getting um, information, there's a lot of web websites. A few, I, just off the top of my head, International Rescue Committee, um, the um, well, UNHCR would have a lot of, of statistics and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of groups that deal with refugee issues. But, yeah, yeah. And by the way, if you're, if you, I mean, internally displaced people, I think often, as bad as it is to be a refugee, to be internally displaced, I think is even worse. Because unless you cross a national border, um, the, U, the UN and other agencies really can't get involved. They do somewhat in some, um, in some relief, relief work, but there's no international protection unless you cross that border. Uh, trauma is another issue and I think we are addressing that. We are setting up uh, within the communities where they come from. We are training caregivers in handling issues of trauma and uh, maybe that is also one area we are addressing the issues of psychological uh, problems that come with displacement and refugee. An observation and a question. Um, there's Theodore Rozak, who's an eco-psychologist, has said that um, Europe, Eastern Europe and Africa look to the United States and the Western world as their future, and that in reality, the situation in Eastern Europe and Africa is our future. Um, feel, making us feel that we're going in a way of increased war and poverty and famine, and that we, in the Western world, feel that we have something to teach you and the truth is I believe you have more to teach us. You've been now in our country for several months studying in Virginia and living with different families and have been exposed to women and families here and when you started speaking you were talking about the role of African women and what what your roles are and how they're evolving. What can you share with us as we are learning as American women and men um, and from your experience in living in both cultures, what do we need to see? What are we, what, what are we not seeing? What are we not doing? What can you teach us? I don't think that I have anything to teach you, but I'm tempted to think that the civil society, not just women, the civil society in Kenya are more active than the civil society here. And in relation to the bomb blast, each, I've talked to many Americans in terms of the retaliation, well, the bomb blast was the worst thing that happened. Then we had this retaliation, the bombing of Afghanistan. I've talked to many Americans and they don't agree with the force that we are using in Afghanistan. But what I wonder is, where is that voice drowned? What else can we do? Maybe we need to be a little bit more proactive on issues of, of peace and, uh, and conflict. That, that is one observation that, that I've come up with. Yeah. Over here and then back there. That was my very question. How, you know, I mean, this is the question I've been asking myself since September 11th, is what more can I do? You know, I've written letters to the newspapers. Mm -hmm. They've said they're more than 250 words. They don't put them in. I mean, it's, I mean, I feel at a loss in this democracy as to what I as an American woman can do. Then at this point, I'd like to share with you the six piece of active nonviolence. First is promote the truth. Second is protest the injustices. Third is part from the injustices yourself. Fourth is penetrate the conscience. Fifth, for those who are religious, is pray. Last is be ready to pay the price. Maybe you need to move from just sending letters to the media, I don't know who controls the media here, to getting together to do something. We participate a lot in demonstrations, starting in our own uh, neighborhood. In Kenya, I'll talk in terms of churches and all that. What are we doing that is fiscal, that can be seen? 
it, it, it will be very hard for maybe even people to read that. But it's the image that we have women holding hands or sitting in DC and saying no. We need audience with the president or the people in, in policy. I think we need to be, again, more proactive. Let's move out of our, our homes and get out, not to the street, but at least something that can impart that image, that can force somebody or some people to listen to us. Yes. Uh, you, last night I asked you a question about a certain organization which you don't need to name, but it involved uh, flowers to France and a certain kind of farm uh, program that sort of went off in another direction and wasn't helpful to the people of Kenya. Um, and I think it's instructive in a way as to perhaps how we might rechannel our efforts or direct those people who are extensions of our efforts to manipulate uh, the world in a different way that it might help the people of Kenya rather than somebody's business pockets. I don't know. Do you remember the story of the flowers? I remember no? that. What is it? And, and the beans? Oh. <laughs> I shared with Tom and my colleagues that uh, when I was in charge of relief, we received, I think, beans that were imported from somewhere that took, you could cook for eight hours and they never cooked. <laughs> yes. And then I received some packages of seeds. Are they cucumber? I can't even. Zucchini. Zucchini, that sort of. And we are saying, hey, what are we doing with all these pumpkins? <laughs> because. I think, again, some of us capitalized on people's suffering. The fact that we were suffering and we were in need of relief, somebody just wanted to capitalize on that and improve his trade. And I think that is why we received the seeds that we thought they were pumpkins. And how can pumpkins satisfy a family of eight that has gone for, for a week without a meal? And relief again can really be abused, and I think these are some of the things we have to speak out. How can we not abuse relief? How can we not buy the diamond that is killing the Democratic Republic of uh, DRC uh, people? I don't know how, how you know about the process. The diamonds you are wearing, I don't know how many are wearing here. I don't know the process, and I don't know if you know that they are the root causes of our 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 conflict. Yeah, in a small way we can can do something. <laughs>